Hey guys! I posted a video in the past that went over the science of sebum and what it actually is. I want to try not to be redundant and repeat all the information again, so before moving on, please pause this video and watch this video so you're all caught up. A lot of us don't really know much about the functionality of sebum. All we know is that when you do the scratch test and there's stuff under your nails, it's time for a wash day. It's something that has turned into a mindless loop. Well, it turns out that sebum is created for a reason and serves a very important role in the overall health and appearance of our hair. So my goal with this video is to show you how to test, regulate, and take advantage of your sebum and use it to your benefit. Before we get into it, pause this video and watch this video on the science of sebum so you can get all caught up on what sebum is what it does, and why it's so special. Fun fact! Did you know African Americans produce more and better quality sebum than Caucasians and Northern Asians? It turns out melanin is not our only fountain of youth. A study done by Dermato Endocrinology back in 2013 showed that compared to Caucasians and Northern Asians, African Americans produce more sebum and more wax ester in our sebum. Meaning our skin is able to retain more moisture and doesn't dry out and wrinkle as quickly. According to the study, due to having more wax ester in our sebum, our sebum is thicker and creates a more moisturizing and conditioning barrier. We're basically walking around with a golden protective armor. So the scale we use to measure our sebum has to be different. This applies to all the lines in the complete hair type chart. It's really easy to tell if your sebum production is on either extreme ends of the line, just by observing the skin on the rest of your body. Sebaceous glands are not just on your scalp, they are all over your body. Depending on the area of your body, they could be a little different, but overall they pretty much work the same. If your skin gets oily and shiny easily and is prone to acne, you're most likely producing high amounts of sebum on your scalp. If your skin dries out fast and you have to use creams and oils to keep it moisturized, you also most likely produce a low amount of sebum on your scalp. These two scenarios are common but not set in stone. Some people have dry skin and an oily scalp, and some have oily skin and a dry scalp. So the best way to test your sebum production is by observing your scalp. It's easy. One week after wash day, do the scratch test to see how long it takes for sebum to build up on your scalp. If you scratch your scalp and see sebum and build up under your fingernails, you have high sebum production. Two weeks after wash day, if you scratch your scalp and see build up under your fingernails, you're somewhere in the middle. If it takes three weeks or more before you see anything under your fingernails, you have low sebum production. Our sebum is a gift that provides our skin and hair with tons of benefits. But if your hair has a tight curl pattern or is dense like mine, it's difficult for your sebum to slide down all those dense loops and bends and can get trapped on your scalp. If unchecked, a mixture of dead skin cells and trapped sebum can collect on your scalp, creating a perfect environment for bacteria and other not so nice critters to flourish. It can lead to an infection, dandruff, and many other possible scalp conditions. Or at the very least, it can clog up your follicles and slow down growth or cause hair loss. So it's really important to take extra effort to free up the built up sebum on your scalp on a routine basis either by regularly washing it away or putting your sebum to use by manually sliding it down the length of your hair through scooping and spreading. Both options are perfectly fine. I have found that scooping and spreading works best for me. Below are links to where I show you my detailed scoop and spread regimen between wash days. Just so you know, sparse hair types can get away with scooping and spreading larger sections compared to denser hair types. Just like with male and female pattern baldness, sebum production is controlled by your hormones. Less available DHT means lower sebum production, 
and more DHT means increased sebum production. Especially for us, sebum is a gift. Producing too little of it can make your hair constantly dry and brittle. Without it, length retention is more complicated. Fortunately for us, our hair loves sebum and can handle a high amount. So as long as you don't develop acne, the goal should be somewhere from the middle to the high end of the line. There are tons of drugs out there that are prescribed to increase or decrease the DHT hormone. I'm not a big fan of that because when it comes to hormones or any other internal system, if you synthetically shoot one up or down, it messes up the balance of the others. So the goal should be regulation and balance. And the only way to do that is through what you eat and expose your body to. If you produce too little or too much sebum, try switching over to a plant-based diet. That will make a huge difference because there are tons of hormones in today's red meat, seafood, and especially chicken. Also, take steps to be more conscious about what you put on your body. Unfortunately, there are tons of ingredients in so-called beauty products that do a number on your hormones. Cleaning up the air you breathe in your home with plants also makes a huge difference. We'll get more into that in the herb series. Here's a list of things you can do externally as well to help alleviate symptoms. Just a quick rundown. Your sebum comes out of your pores. If they get clogged, it can throw them off and cause an infection like dandruff. So apart from organic shampoos, some water-based products, essential and organic oils, nothing else should really come in contact with your scalp, especially conditioners, creams, gels, and proteins. Herbs and plants are medicine, so they actively do things when we eat them and when they come into contact with your scalp. For example, stinging nettle and saw palmetto have been scientifically proven to regulate sebum production when used topically or eaten. Apple cider vinegar also works well at unclogging the pores on your scalp and killing bacteria and microbes. I posted a detailed series on apple cider vinegar. I talked about the science of how apple cider vinegar cleans your hair, how to make your own from scratch, instructions on how to use it, and talked about what the mother is and if it's beneficial. You can find the links to the ACV series below. Clays are also really powerful cleansing agents. They're antibacterial, detoxifying, and they also remove oily buildup. Below are links to the clay series. I talked about the science of how clays work on your hair. I did an experiment to see if clays can really loosen your curl pattern. Compared different clays and gave you a great recipe that covers all the bases. Scooping and spreading is a great technique for keeping your pores unclogged and your sebum production regulated. It's the only option that also allows you to take full advantage of your sebum. Scalp health and maintenance is just as much an internal effort as it is external. If you don't pay attention, it can shut everything down. So when building a healthy hair regimen, don't forget to include your scalp. As always, thanks for watching. See you in the next video.